The fairy tale is out there. The fairy tale is in here. The fairy tale is everywhere. You just have to be able to see it. You might find it in a spinning top, in a duckling, in your own life, in nature, the wind, animals, birds, the trees, in all that you see, and in all that lurks beneath the surface. <gasps> oh yes, pardon me. My name is Anderson, Hans Christian Anderson, or H. C. Anderson. I have this thing about fairy tales. A soldier came marching along the high road. Left, right, left, right. He had his knapsack on his back and a sword at his side. He had been to the wars and was now returning home. As he walked on, he met a very frightful looking old witch in the road. Her underlip hung quite down on her breast and she stopped and said, Good evening, soldier. You have a very fine sword and a large knapsack and you are a real soldier, so you shall have as much money as ever you like. Thank you, old witch, said the soldier. Do you see that large tree, said the witch, pointing to a tree which stood beside them? Well, it is quite hollow inside and you must climb to the top when you will see a hole through which you can let yourself down into the tree to a great depth. I will tie a rope around your body so that I can pull you up again when you call out to me. But what am I to do down there in the tree? asked the soldier. Get money, she replied, for you must know that when you reach the ground under the tree, you will find yourself in a large hall, lighted up by three hundred lamps. You will then see three doors, which can be easily opened, for the keys are in all the locks. On entering the first of the chambers to which these doors lead, you will see a large chest standing in the middle of the floor, and upon it a dog seated with a pair of eyes as large as teacups. But you need not be at all afraid of him. I will give you my blue checked apron, which you must spread upon the floor and then boldly seize hold of the dog and place him upon it. You can then open the chest and take from it as many pence as you please. They are only copper pence. But if you would rather have silver money, you must go into the second chamber. Here you will find another dog with eyes as big as mill wheels. But do not let that trouble you. Place him upon my apron and then take what money you please. If, however, you like gold best, enter the third chamber where there is another chest full of it. The dog who sits on this chest is very dreadful. His eyes are as big as a tower, but do not mind him. If he also is placed upon my apron, he cannot hurt you, and you may take from the chest what gold you will. This is not a bad story, said the soldier, but what am I to give you, you old witch? For of course you do not mean to tell me all this for nothing. No, said the witch. But I don't ask for a single penny. Only promise to bring me an old tinder box which my grandmother left behind the last time she went down there. Very well, I promise. Now tie the rope around my body. Here it is, replied the witch. And here is my blue checked apron. As soon as the rope was tied, the soldier climbed up the tree and let himself down through the hollow to the ground beneath. And here he found, as the witch had told him, a large hall in which many hundred lamps were all burning. Then he opened the first door. Ah! There sat the dog with eyes as large as teacups staring at him. You're a pretty fellow, said the soldier, seizing him and placing him on the witch's apron while he filled his pockets from the chest with as many pieces as they would hold. Then he closed the lid, seated the dog upon it again, and walked into another chamber. And sure enough, there sat the dog with eyes as big as mill wheels. You'd better not look at me in that way, said the soldier. 
you will make your eyes water. And then he seated him also upon the apron and opened the chest. But when he saw what a quantity of silver money it contained, he very quickly threw away all the coppers he had taken and filled his pockets and his knapsack with nothing but silver. Then he went into the third room. And there the dog was really hideous. His eyes were truly as big as towers, and they turned round and round in his head like wheels. Good morning, said the soldier, touching his cap, for he had never seen such a dog in his life. But after looking at him more closely, he thought he had been civil enough, so he placed him on the floor and opened the chest. Goodness gracious, what a quantity of gold there was! Enough to buy all the sugar sticks of the sweet stuff women, all the tin soldiers, whips and rocking horses in the world, or even the whole town itself. There was indeed an immense quantity. So the soldier now threw away all the silver money he had taken and filled his pockets and his knapsack with gold instead. And not only his pockets and his knapsack, but even his cap and boots, so that he could scarcely walk. He was really rich now. So he replaced the dog on the chest, closed the door and called up through the tree, Now pull me out, you old witch. Have you got the tinderbox? asked the witch. No, I declare I quite forgot it. So he went back and fetched the tinderbox. And then the witch drew him up out of the tree, and he stood again in the high road, with his pockets, his knapsack, his cap, and his boots full of gold. What are you going to do with the tinderbox? asked the soldier. That's nothing to you, replied the witch. You have the money, now give me the tinderbox. I tell you what, said the soldier, if you don't tell me what you're going to do with it, I will draw my sword and cut off your head. No, said the witch. The soldier immediately cut off her head, and there she lay on the ground. Then he tied up all his money in her apron, and slung it on his back like a bundle, put the tinderbox in his pocket, and walked off to the nearest town. It was a very nice town, and he put up at the best inn, and ordered a dinner of all his favorite dishes, for now he was rich and had plenty of money. The servant who cleaned his boots thought they certainly were a shabby pair to be worn by such a rich gentleman, for he had not yet bought any new ones. The next day, however, he procured some good clothes and proper boots, so that our soldier soon became known as a fine gentleman, and the people visited him and told him of all the wonders that were to be seen in the town, and of the king's beautiful daughter, the princess. Where can I see her? asked the soldier. She's not to be seen at all, they said. She lives in a large copper castle, surrounded by walls and towers. No one but the king himself can pass in or out, for there has been a prophecy that she will marry a common soldier, and the king cannot bear to think of such a marriage. I should like very much to see her, thought the soldier, but he could not obtain permission to do so. However, he passed a very pleasant time, went to the theatre, drove in the king's garden, and gave a great deal of money to the poor, which was very good of him. He remembered what it had been in olden times to be without a shilling. Now he was rich, had fine clothes and many friends, who all declared he was a fine fellow and a real gentleman, and all this gratified him exceedingly. But his money would not last forever. And as he spent and gave away a great deal daily and received none, he found himself at last with only two shillings left, so he was obliged to leave his elegant rooms and live in a little garret under the roof, where he had to clean his own boots and even mend them with a large needle. None of his friends came to see him. There were too many stairs to mount up. One dark evening, he had not even a penny to buy a candle. Then all at once he remembered that there was a piece of candle stuck in the tinderbox, which he had brought from the old tree, into which the witch had helped him. He found the tinderbox, but no sooner had he struck a few sparks from the flint and steel than the door flew open, 
And the dog with eyes as big as teacups whom he had seen while down in the tree stood before him and said, What orders, master? Hello, said the soldier. Well, this is a pleasant tinderbox if it brings me all I wish for. Bring me some money, said he to the dog. He was gone in a moment and presently returned, carrying a large bag of coppers in his mouth. The soldier very soon discovered after this the value of the tinderbox. If he struck the flint once, the dog who sat on the chest of copper money made his appearance. If twice, the dog came from the chest of silver. And if three times, the dog with eyes like towers who watched over the gold. The soldier again now had plenty of money. He returned to his elegant rooms and reappeared in his fine clothes so that his friends knew him again directly and made as much of him as before. After a while, he began to think it was very strange that no one could get a look at the princess. Everyone says she is very beautiful, thought he to himself. But what is the use of that if she is to be shut up in a copper castle surrounded by so many towers? Can I by any means get to see her? Stop! Where's my tinderbox? Then he struck a light, and in a moment the dog with eyes as big as teacups stood before him. It is midnight, said the soldier, yet I should very much like to see the princess, if only for a moment. The dog disappeared instantly. And before the soldier could even look round, he returned with the princess. She was lying on the dog's back asleep, and looked so lovely that everyone who saw her would know that she was a real princess. The soldier could not help kissing her, true soldier as he was. Then the dog ran back with the princess. But in the morning, while at breakfast with the king and queen, she told them what a singular dream she had had during the night of a dog and a soldier, that she had ridden on the dog's back and had been kissed by the soldier. That's a very pretty story indeed, said the queen. So the next night, one of the old ladies of the court was set to watch by the princess's bed to discover whether it really was a dream or what else it might be. The soldier longed very much to see the princess once more, so he sent for the dog again in the night to fetch her and to run with her as fast as ever he could. But the old lady put on water boots and ran after him as quickly as he did. She found that he carried the princess into a large house. She thought it would help her to remember the place if she made a large cross on the door with a piece of chalk. Then she went home to bed. The dog presently returned with the princess. But when he saw that a cross had been made on the door of the house where the soldier lived, he took another piece of chalk and made crosses on all the doors in the town, so that the lady-in-waiting might not be able to find out the right door. Early the next morning, the king and queen accompanied the lady and all the officers of the household to see where the princess had been. Here it is, said the king, when they came to the first door with a cross on it. No, my dear husband, it must be that one said the queen, pointing to a second door having a cross also. And here is one, and there is another, they all exclaimed, for there were crosses on all the doors in every direction, so they felt it would be useless to search any farther. But the queen was a very clever woman. She could do a great deal more than merely ride in a carriage. She took a large gold scissors, cut a piece of silk into squares, and made a neat little bag. This bag she filled with buckwheat flour and tied it round the princess's neck and then she cut a small hole in the bag so that the flour might be scattered on the ground as the princess went along. During the night the dog came again and carried the princess on his back and ran with her to the soldier who loved her very much and wished that he had been a prince so that he might have her for a wife. 
The dog did not observe how the flower ran out of the bag all the way from the castle wall to the soldier's house and even up to the window where he had climbed with the princess. Therefore, in the morning, the king and queen found out where their daughter had been and the soldier was taken up and put in prison. Oh, how dark and disagreeable it was as he sat there. And the people said to him, Tomorrow you will be hanged. It was not very pleasant news, and besides, he'd left the tinderbox at the inn. In the morning, he could see through the iron grating of the little window how the people were hastening out of the town to see him hanged. He heard the drums beating and saw the soldiers marching. Everyone ran out to look at them, and a shoemaker's boy with a leather apron and slippers on galloped by so fast that one of his slippers flew off and struck against the wall where the soldier sat, looking through the iron grating. Hello, you, shoemaker's boy! You need not be in such a hurry, cried the soldier to him. There will be nothing to see till I come. But if you will run to the house where I have been living and bring me my tinderbox, you shall have four shillings. But you must put your best foot foremost. The shoemaker's boy liked the idea of getting the four shillings, so he ran very fast and fetched the tinderbox and gave it to the soldier. And now we shall see what happened. Outside the town, a large gibbet had been erected, round which stood the soldiers and several thousands of people. The king and the queen sat on splendid thrones opposite to the judges and the whole council. The soldier already stood on the ladder. But as they were about to place the rope around his neck, he said that an innocent request was often granted to a poor criminal before he suffered death. He wished very much to smoke a pipe, as it would be the last pipe he should ever smoke in the world. The king could not refuse this request. So the soldier took his tinderbox and struck fire, once, twice, thrice. And there in a moment stood all the dogs, the one with eyes as big as teacups the one with eyes as large as mill wheels and the third whose eyes were like towers. Help me now that I may not be hanged, cried the soldier. And the dogs fell upon the judges and all the counsellors, seized one by the legs and another by the nose and tossed them many feet high in the air so that they fell down and were dashed to pieces. I will not be touched, said the king. But the largest dog seized him, as well as the queen, and threw them after the others. Then the soldiers and all the people were afraid and cried, Good soldier, you shall be our king and you shall marry the beautiful princess. So they placed the soldier in the king's carriage, and the three dogs ran on in front and cried, Hurrah! And the little boys whistled through their fingers, and the soldiers presented arms. The princess came out of the copper castle and became queen, which was very pleasing to her. The wedding lasted a whole week, and the dogs sat at the table and stared with all their eyes. Oh, what a story! Maybe not too much fun for the king and the queen and the witch, but quite wonderful for the soldier. All his dreams had come true. And dreams, marvelous dreams, is something we all have. It is important to dream, to fantasize, to yearn for something. Only in that way can we achieve the fabulous. And both we and life deserve that once in a while. But it is important never to lose contact with reality. There was once a woman who lived in a cottage. Of eggs she had scarcely a shortage, for her good hen gave one each day. The task of a hen is surely to lay. The total soon grew to more than two score, and this was quite a number, she swore. Packing them nicely away, she sped, basket held high on her head. To market town briskly, then off she strode, but long and lonesome she felt the road, 
All her best efforts, though, surmounting, she tried to work out on her fingers, counting, how much she'd make when her eggs were sold, a nice tidy sum of silver, all told. For these, she prattled while on the highway, I'll get a florin if I have my way. For that I shall buy me two hens, you'll see, with one at home that'll now make three. Each will lay eggs, and it would be funny if I couldn't again make plenty of money. I'll buy three more hens, then it's six they'll make. With those I've at home, their good eggs I'll take. I'll sell only half, and then all the rest shall hatch into chicks. That is far the best. I'll soon have a poultry farm, just imagine. And it'll grow big, hens are always a bargain. And some will lay eggs and some hatch out chicks. They'll make me a fortune, my hens all six. I'll buy me two geese and a little sheep. And never shall I have cause to weep. With eggs and with hens and with feathers and wool, my purse in the end will be quite full. I'll buy me a pig, I'll buy me a cow, or maybe two, I'll soon find out how. Then money I'll spin, in a year just you peep, I'll have house and maids and cows and sheep. Now in comes a suitor, my hand he kisses, soon all the good people will call me Mrs. For he has a farm that is bigger than mine. So stylish I'll be, and so haughty and fine. No, I'll not stand any foolish nonsense. I'll toss my head, yes indeed, with a vengeance. And lo, as she spoke, that is just what she did. Smash! Down to the ground her eggs all slid. Her dreams of bliss to an end they did bring. And this was perhaps a very good thing. But it is not only the simple peasant woman who found it difficult to keep her sense. No, the dream of being somebody is rife in all parts of society, even in the highest places. The Emperor's New Suit Many, many years ago lived an emperor who thought so much of new clothes that he spent all his money in order to obtain them. His only ambition was to be always well-dressed. He did not care for his soldiers, and the theater did not amuse him. The only thing he thought anything of was to drive out and show off a new suit of clothes. He had a coat for every hour of the day. And as one would say of a king, he is in his cabinet. So one could say of him, the emperor is in his dressing room. The great city where he resided was very gay. Every day, many strangers arrived. One day, two swindlers came along. They made people believe that they were weavers and declared they could manufacture the finest cloth to be imagined. Their colors and patterns, they said, were not only exceptionally beautiful, but the clothes made of their material possessed the wonderful quality of being invisible to any man who was unfit for his office or unpardonably stupid. That must be wonderful cloth, thought the emperor. If I were to be dressed in a suit made of this cloth, I should be able to find out which men in my empire were unfit for their places. 
and I could distinguish the clever from the stupid. I must have this cloth woven for me without delay. And he gave a large sum of money to the swindlers in advance that they should set to work without any loss of time. They set up two looms and pretended to be very hard at work, but they did nothing whatever on the looms. They asked for the finest silk and the most precious gold cloth. All they got they did away with. And then they worked at the empty looms till late at night. I should very much like to know how they are getting on with the cloth, thought the emperor. But he felt rather uneasy when he remembered that he who was not fit for his office, or plain stupid, could not see the cloth. Personally, he was of the opinion that he had nothing to fear. Yet he thought it advisable to send somebody else first to see how matters stood. Everybody in the town knew what a remarkable quality the stuff possessed. And all were anxious to see how bad, or stupid, their neighbours were. I shall send my honest old minister to the weavers, thought the emperor. He can judge best how the stuff looks, for he is intelligent, and nobody understands his office better than he. The good old minister went into the room where the swindlers sat before the empty looms. Heaven preserve us, he thought, and opened his eyes wide. I cannot see anything at all, but he did not say so. Both swindlers now requested him to come near and asked him if he did not admire the exquisite pattern and the beautiful colours, pointing to the empty looms. The poor old minister tried his very best, but he could see nothing, for there was nothing to be seen. Oh dear, he thought, can I be so stupid? I should never have thought so, and nobody must know it. Is it possible that I am not fit for my office? No, no, I cannot say that I was unable to see the cloth. Now, have you got nothing to say? said one of the swindlers. Oh, it is very pretty, exceedingly beautiful, replied the old minister, looking through his glasses. What a beautiful pattern! What brilliant colours! I shall tell the emperor that I like the cloth very much. We are pleased to hear that, said the two weavers, and described to him the colours, and explained the curious pattern. The old minister listened attentively, that he might relate to the emperor what they said when he returned. And so he did. Now the swindlers asked for more money, silk and gold cloth, which they required for weaving. They kept everything for themselves, and not a thread came near the loom. But they continued as hitherto to work at the empty looms. Soon afterwards, the emperor sent another honest courtier to the weavers to see how they were getting on and if the cloth was nearly finished. Like the old minister, he looked and looked at the empty looms but could see nothing as there was nothing to be seen. Is it not a beautiful piece of cloth? asked the two swindlers, showing and explaining the magnificent pattern which, however, did not exist. I'm not stupid, thought the man. It is therefore my good appointment for which I'm not fit. It's very strange, but I must not let anyone know it. And he praised the cloth which he did not see and expressed his joy at the beautiful colours and the fine pattern. It is exceedingly excellent, he said to the emperor. Everybody in the whole town talked about the precious cloth. At last the emperor wished to see it himself, while it was still on the loom. With a number of courtiers, including the two ministers who had already been there, 
he now went to the two clever swindlers, who were now working just as hard as they could, but without using any thread. Is it not magnificent? said the two old statesmen who had been there before. Your Majesty must admire the colours and the pattern. And then they pointed to the empty looms, for they imagined the others could see the cloth. What is this? thought the Emperor. I don't see anything at all. That's terrible. Am I stupid? Am I unfit to be Emperor? That would indeed be the most dreadful thing that could happen to me. Really? he said, turning to the weavers. Your cloth has our most gracious approval. And nodding contentedly, he looked at the empty loom, for he did not like to say that he saw nothing. All his attendants who were with him looked and looked, and although they could not see anything more than the others, they said, like the emperor, Oh, it is very beautiful! And they all advised him to wear the new magnificent clothes at a great procession, which was soon to take place. Oh, it is magnificent! Excellent! one heard them say. Everybody seemed to be delighted. And the emperor appointed the two swindlers, both of them, imperial court weavers. The whole night previous to the day on which the procession was to take place, the swindlers pretended to work and burned more than sixteen candles. People should see that they were busy to finish the emperor's new suit. They pretended to take the cloth from the loom and worked about in the air with big scissors and sewed with needles without thread and said at last, the emperor's new suit is ready now. The emperor and all his barons then came to the hall. The swindlers held their arms up as if they held something in their hands and said, These are the trousers, this is the coat, and here is the cloak, and so on. They are all as light as a cobweb. One must feel as if one had nothing upon the body. But that's just the beauty of them. Indeed, said all the courtiers, but they could not see anything for there was nothing. Does it please your majesty now to graciously undress, said the swindlers, that we may assist your majesty in putting on the new suit? The emperor undressed, and the swindlers pretended to put the new suit upon him, one piece after another, and the emperor looked at himself in the glass from every side. How well they look! How well they fit, said all. What a beautiful pattern! What fine colours! That is a magnificent suit of clothes. The master of the ceremonies announced that the bearers of the canopy, which was to be carried in the procession, were ready. Well, I am ready, said the emperor. Does not my suit fit me? Then he turned once more to the looking-glass, that people should think he admired his new garments. The chamberlains, who were to carry the train, stretched their hands to the ground, as if they lifted up a train and pretended to hold something. They did not like people to know that they could not see anything. The emperor marched in the procession under the beautiful canopy, and all who saw him in the street and out of the windows exclaimed, Indeed, the emperor's new suit is incomparable! What a long train he has! How well it fits him! Nobody wished to let others know he saw nothing, for then he would have been unfit for his office, or too stupid. Never were emperor's clothes more admired. But he has nothing on at all, said a little child at last. Good heavens! Listen to the voice of an innocent child, said the father, and one whispered to the other what the child had said. But he has nothing on at all, cried at last the whole people. That made a deep impression upon the emperor, for it seemed to him that they were right, but he thought to himself, now I must bear up to the end. And the chamberlains walked on with dignity as if they carried the train which didn't exist.
But just because you spring from imperial or royal blood, you do not have to be blind to what is true, what is real and natural. You may still have a keen eye for what is bad form and what comes from the heart brought about by the moment. There are many stories about this in books or at the theatre. Far in the interior of the country lay an old baronial hall, and in it lived an old proprietor, who had two sons, which two young men thought themselves too clever by half. They wanted to woo the king's daughter, for the maiden in question had publicly announced that she would choose for her husband the youth who could arrange his words best. So these two geniuses prepared themselves a week for the wooing. This was the longest time that could be granted them, but it was enough, for they had had much preparatory information, which is useful. One of them knew the whole Latin dictionary by heart, and three whole years of the daily paper of the little town into the bargain, backwards and forwards. The other was deeply read in the corporation laws and knew by heart what every corporation ought to know. And he thought he could talk of affairs of state. And he knew one thing more. He could embroider braces, for he was a light-fingered fellow. I shall win the princess, they both cried. <laughs> Their father gave them each a handsome horse. He, who knew the dictionary and newspaper, had a milk-white one. And he, who knew all about the corporation laws and could embroider, had a black steed. Then they rubbed the corners of their mouths with fish oil so that they might become very smooth. All the servants stood below in the courtyard and looked on while they mounted their horses. Just by chance, the third son came up, for there were three. Though nobody counted the third with his brothers. Because he was not so learned as they, and indeed, he was generally known as Jack the Dullard. Hello, where are you going? Why do you have on your Sunday clothes? asked Jack. We're going to the king's court as suitors to the king's daughter. Don't you know the announcement that has been made all through the country? And then they told him all about it. My word, I'll be in it too, cried Jack the Dullard and his two brothers burst out laughing at him and rode away. Ah! I must have a horse too! I do feel so desperately inclined to marry. If she accepts me, she accepts me. And if she won't have me, I'll have her, but she shall be mine! Don't talk nonsense. 
You shall have no horse from me. You don't know how to speak. You can't arrange your words. Your brothers are very different fellows from you. Well, if I can't have a horse, I'll take the billy goat who belongs to me, and he can carry me very well. And so said, so done. He mounted the billy goat, pressed his heels into its side, and galloped down the high street like a hurricane. Hi, hope that was a ride. <coughs> Tally ho, here I come. <coughs> and he sang till his voice echoed. But his brothers rode slowly on in advance of him. They spoke not a word, for they were thinking about the fine extempore speeches they would have to bring out, and these had to be cleverly prepared beforehand. Tell a ho! shouted Jack the Dullard. Here am I! Look what I found on the high road! And he showed them what it was, and it was a dead crow. Dullard! exclaimed the brothers. What are you going to do with that? With the crow? Why, I'm going to give it to the princess. Yes, do so, said they, and they laughed and rode on. Tally-ho, here I am again. Just see what I found now. You don't find that on the high road every day. And the brothers turned round to see what he could have found now. Dullard, they cried. That's only an old wooden shoe, and the upper part is missing into the bargain. Are you going to give that to the princess as well? Most certainly I shall, replied Jack the Dullard. And again the brothers laughed and rode on, and thus they got far in advance of him. Tally-ho! And there was Jack the Dullard again. It's getting better and better, he cried. Hooray! It's quite fabulous! What have you found this time, inquired the brothers. Oh, said Jack the Dullard, I can hardly tell you. How glad the princess will be! Bah! said the brothers. That's nothing but clay out of the ditch! Yes, certainly it is, said Jack the Dullard, and clay of the finest sort. See, it is so wet it runs through one's fingers. And then he filled his pockets. But his brothers galloped on till the sparks flew and consequently they arrived a full hour earlier at the town gate before Jack. Now at the gate each shooter was provided with a number and all were placed in rows immediately on their arrival, six in each row, and so closely packed together that they could not move their arms. And that was a wise arrangement, for they would certainly have come to blows had they been able, merely because one of them stood before the other. All the inhabitants of the country round about stood in great crowds around the castle just to see the princess receive the suitors. And as each stepped into the hall, his power of speech seemed to desert him. He is of no use, the princess would say. Away with him. At last the turn came for that brother who knew the dictionary. But he didn't know it now. He had absolutely forgotten it altogether, and the board seemed to re-echo with his footsteps, and the ceiling of the hall was made of looking-glass, so that he saw himself standing on his head, and at the window stood three clerks and a head clerk, and every one of them was writing down every single word that was uttered, so that it might be printed in the newspapers and sold for a penny at the street corners. It was a terrible ordeal! <laughs> and they had, moreover, made such a fire in the stove that the room seemed quite red-hot. Phew! It's dreadfully hot in here, observed the first brother. Yes, it's because my father's going to roast young pullets today. Bah! There he stood like a bar lamb. He had not been prepared for a speech of this kind and had not a word to say, though he intended to say something witty. Bleh. He is of no use, said the princess. Away with him. And so he was obliged to go. And now the second brother came in. It's terribly warm in here, he observed. Yes, we're roasting pullets today, replied the princess. What, what, what? 
and all the clerks wrote down, what, what, what? He's of no use, said the princess. Away! Now came Jack the Dullard. He rode his goat into the hall. It's very hot in here, he said. Yes, because I'm roasting young pullets, replied the princess. Ah, that's lucky, exclaimed Jack the Dullard. I suppose you'll let me roast my crow then. With the greatest pleasure, said the princess. But have you anything you can roast it in? For I have neither pot nor pan. Certainly I have, said Jack. Here's a cooking utensil with a tin handle. And then he brought out the old wooden shoe and put the crow into it. Well, that is a wonderful dish, said the princess. But what shall we do for the sauce? Oh, I have that in my pocket, said Jack. I have so much of it that I can afford to throw some away. And then he poured some of the clay out of his pocket. I like that, said the princess. You can give an answer and you have something to say for yourself and so you shall be my husband. But are you aware that every word we speak is being taken down and will be published in the paper tomorrow? Look yonder and you will see in every window three clerks and a head clerk. And the old head clerk is the worst of all for he can't understand anything. But she only said this to frighten him. And all the clerks spurted a blot out of his pen onto the floor. Oh, those are the gentlemen, are they? said Jack. Then I will give the best I have to the head clerk. And then he turned out his pockets and flung the wet clay full in the head clerk's face. That was very cleverly done, observed the princess. I could not have done that, but I shall learn in time. And then Jack was made a king and received a crown and a wife and sat upon a throne. And this report we have wet from the press of the head clerk, but he is not to be depended upon. Tally-ho! Here I am! A crow, a clog and some sludge. Sometimes that is all you need to force your way into a heart.